Hi, my name is Laura Lee, and this is It's Not About Food. So it's not about food, and it's not about weight. What is it about? Everything else. Because it's never ever about food, or weight, never ever, not even, one time, not ever, ever, ever. Hi, so today's topic is compassion. Compassion is the foundation of all recovery. No matter what the recovery is, we have to learn how to have compassion for ourselves. One of the things that's really necessary in recovery is to become conscious of what we're doing. And if we don't have the compassionate piece in place, it's too painful. It's too painful to look at what we're doing with food or weight or alcohol or drugs or money or whatever way that our recoveries are going. It's too painful for us to do that unless we have a lot of compassion and understanding, respect, honor, and make peace with ourselves who's going through the this very important reason for this eating disorder. And that's the other thing to remember, to have compassion for yourself, that this is how you've learned to take care of yourself. You're not stupid. You're not weak-willed. You're not um, undisciplined. You're not lazy. As a matter of fact, you're very, very strong to be able to be out in the world with an eating disorder. But what we have to really remember is that we have a very good reason for why we started using food and or dieting and or restriction, whatever way that your eating disorder comes out right now. It's a very good reason why you have that. And your whole job will be to figure out why you have it and then how to take care of yourself in a different way. So developing a non-judgmental observer is sort of the part of us that gets to be like, wow, I, I did this and then isn't that interesting? I started eating all the cookies and wow, I felt this and isn't that interesting? I started to not ever wanting to eat. Wow, I looked at the mirror and I decided to go on a diet or I felt this way and I decided to stop the diet, whatever it is. And another important part about compassion as the foundation of all recovery is to remember that we are going for holistic growth. We are body, mind, and spirit. And that's what we're going for. Not just a dress size, not just a look better in clothes, but to actually have a better relationship with ourselves, our bodies, our minds, our souls, our spirits. So today we have a guest, Carol Normandy, who is the other founder of Beyond Hunger and the co-author with me with It's Not About Food and Over It and the Body Love Cards. So hi, Carol. Hi, Laura Lee. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's fun to have you here. It's fun to be here. So tell me what you've been up to, what you're doing these days, and also what do you think about compassion, especially with an eating disorder? Okay, well, I have a private practice of San Rafael where I work primarily with eating disorder recovery. And I just started a program called Emrita Eating Disorder Treatment that is an intensive outpatient program for people in recovery for eating disorders because we didn't have a local program and we really needed one. Compassion is one of my most favorite topics because I think that that was the primary key in my own recovery from my own eating disorder. I was a pretty severe bulimic. And by by the time I'd gotten to that stage, I'd had many years of practice of self-hatred and judgment and critical thinking. And most people who suffer from disordered eating behaviors or body um, dissatisfaction have a very intensive critical voice. And so it's really hard to do this recovery until we start to learn how to be kind and loving to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think compassion um, is a very important first step. So you talked about compassion being the foundation of our recovery because until we can have compassion for ourselves, it's very hard to be honest and open with our behaviors because mm-hmm. we're so angry at ourselves for them. Yeah. 
And we go into denial. We don't want to look at them. We don't want to think about them because it's just too upsetting. But when we start to realize that there's actually a very good reason why we develop these behaviors, usually for self-protection, usually to take care of ourselves emotionally because we didn't have any other tools, Mm -hmm. then we can start to understand and have compassion for why we're where we are and then start the healing process. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that part where we start an eating disorder or whatever way whatever we start to take care of ourselves. What, what is that about for us? Like we just are, there's nothing else that we can come up with or we just don't know how to feel our feelings or what is that about for us, do you think? Well, I think it's a complicated combination of the different ways that we've been conditioned in our society and family. Right. Um, so we come in as a very pure, sensitive being, and then we get exposed to a number of different things that make us either feel bad about ourselves or critical about ourselves, or we have experiences and we don't know how to work with them or cope with them or process them. We live in a culture that really doesn't teach us emotional literacy, although we're getting better at that. Yeah. So learning how to be able to acknowledge Uh, recognize, acknowledge, and process our feelings in a healthy way, we're not really taught. So oftentimes we use things to cope with those overwhelming feelings, drugs, alcohol. But the first, um, really the first drug we have available to us is food. So it's not uncommon for people to pick up food um, and use our relationship with food as a way to soothe ourselves. So by actually eating to feel better about ourselves Mm -hmm. or by dieting and not eating to feel better about ourselves to changing our body because we're taught men and women um, that our bodies are not okay. And it's a place where we're continually criticized through the media. Mm -hmm. And so it's a place that we try to control. So Mm -hmm. we try to be thinner or prettier or fill in the blank. Right. And use dieting, um, and not eating also as a way to feel better ourselves. So either overeating or undereating becomes a way to try to cope with feeling upset or out of control. Yeah, and I think that's one of the most sort of uh, weird things that I discovered about myself as I was recovering that uh, all parts of an eating disorder were ways I was taking care of myself. So whether it was eating a bunch, it was also not eating or it was dieting, because I felt so much more in control once I started to diet, it, because I my life was falling apart when I was a kid, but I could control my food, and so that felt really so much more safe. Right, and it's not, it's, it's as you know, because we wrote this in our book, it's not just <laughs> our the book says. eating behaviors, it's also the, um, the mental behaviors. Like, it, the more we can obsess and think about what we should or shouldn't look like or what we should or shouldn't weigh, then the easier it is to step out of our feelings. And the more we can be angry at ourself for how we're not good enough, we're not pretty enough, whatever, the easier it is not to be angry at others because we're we're taught, especially as females in this culture, not to be angry with others. Exactly, so if somebody's treating us badly, it's easier to think, well, I must be the problem. So then I can change it and then the situation will change, rather than maybe that person is not really such a good person for us. Right, exactly. Or maybe there's a boundary that needs to be put down. Right, and then what happens is we get in this cycle of, we create these eating disorder behaviors, um, and then we, on top of these problems, we hate ourselves for having them. That's right. And so we're in this endless cycle of judgment and hatred and frustration with ourselves and anger with ourselves. And so the first place of stepping in and stopping that cycle is having compassion and really understanding that there is a very valid reasons why we are doing these behaviors. And the work is to understand them and then to be kind to ourselves around them. Yeah, and I know that for me, I couldn't figure out every time that <clears throat> I would overeat or want to go on a diet or what, or binge and purge or whatever way I was 
during my eating disorder at that time, I couldn't figure out how that was helping myself at all. It just felt like I was actually punishing myself and self-sabotaging is what I thought. So going through recovery, I thought, no, actually, this is a very sweet little part of us, of me, that needed help and needed understanding and compassion. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And how do we get there in the moment, you know, when we're in the whole eating disorder? Right. Well, I think that it's, it's loving kindness and being compassionate is definitely a practice. It's not something that we wake up and we say, okay, I'm going to be kind to myself today because it's, it's like learning a foreign language. You have no language for it. You have no experience right. for it. You have to learn all over the words and the behaviors and the actions, and then you have to practice it consistently. And in the beginning, it can feel really foreign. It can feel uncomfortable. It can feel fake. It can feel like you're telling a lie. Yeah. But with time and practice, as you begin to start identifying the critical thoughts, and the first step is just being aware of them. Oh, right now I'm having a fat thought. Oh, right now I'm having a mean thought. Oh, right now I'm being really judgmental of myself. And you notice it. And then you can say, what else is true? Or what's a kind, loving way to respond? Or how would, how would I respond to my best friend who had this? Yeah, and can I respond right. that way to myself? Right. If I had a little girl and her name was Laura Lee, what would I say to her when she was really having this problem? Right. Right. Yeah. Sometimes it's much easier to imagine ourselves doing it with our own inner child or a best friend than to ourselves, because it's a lot harder to be kind right. to ourselves. And isn't that crazy? It's crazy. <laughs> crazy. It's crazy. Crazy making and crazy yeah. that we haven't been taught as tiny children all the way up into now in my 60s, late 60s, that, you know, I'm okay, actually. Yeah. Actually, I'm great. I'm fine. I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing. And I wasted all those years of not knowing that I was okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Trying to hide from that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you had somebody who you were wanting to get, uh, like somebody that was like you when you were this young girl um, going through this, and you wanted to be able to say something to her, what would that be like the hope for the future for her? Like, what would you have liked to have heard? Um, I think I would. I think it's important to be able to say, as we've said, first of all, that there's a really good reason why you have this. There's there's a lesson here. There's a learning here. Mm -hmm. Like everything in life, the the contrast that we go through, the struggles that we go through, are a way if we pay attention to bring ourselves back home to the things that are most important to us, right? So I think yeah. it's important for people to understand that as hard as this illness is and as frustra frustrating as it is, and sometimes it feels so out of co our control, that there's a really important reason why it's we have it, why we've used it, and that there's a pathway out. There's a pathway to recovery. And then that pathway we'll find parts of ourselves that we didn't know existed, like the loving part of ourselves. Yeah. And like then the good I, parent part of us. Yeah, ourself, the good right? parent part of herself. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think that um, I don't think there's any greater practice in the world for anyone than learning to be loving and kind. Yeah. Once we do what that. What a concept. We, right. <laughs> <laughs> Once we do that to ourselves, we can do it to each other. Yes. Right? Yes. So our our brain is wired to be judgmental and critical and always looking out for the negative and, and being in survival mode. And so or the tiger behind us. Right. Right. And again, social media just reinforces that wiring yeah. that really zeroes in on people's appearance because we're taught to do that. Yeah. So we can walk along and notice that a hundred times a day we're judging what we look like and judging what other people look like and completely missing the experience of ourselves and of exactly. other people. Exactly, Life is going on while we're all in our head thinking about how terrible we are. Right. Or exactly. somebody else is. Right. Yeah. Right. So being able to really practice notifying those critical thoughts and just taking a breath and stopping and saying, okay, what else is true that's kinder and loving, more loving and deeper? Yeah. Right. 
It's complete. This is the other thing I would say to someone. It's completely possible to retrain ourselves to see the beauty in all things, including ourselves. Yes. And that what an incredible gift that is. Yeah. And when we're little, just like uh, other parts of the recovery, we have this down as tiny kids. Right. You know, somehow it's taken out of us in the society that we live in as we grow up in it. But we have it when we're little. We just think we're the coolest things ever. Right. I love some of the pictures and images when you see little toddlers before they've been trained. Yeah. right? And they're looking in the mirror and they're oh. just totally enthralled with themselves. Yes. It's such a miracle and it's so exciting and yes. it's so wonderful. They and see so their foot or their hand. They're like, so, oh, my God, this is right here <laughs> on me. I have yeah. this. Yeah, they love it. <laughs> And they think they're like their best friends when Mm -hmm. they see themselves in the mirror, like, hi, Mm -hmm. where we're looking at ourselves and going, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, this is not, I don't like this, I don't like this. So, and to have compassion for ourselves that we live in a society that has taught us that. Right. Yeah. And to understand that it's just conditioning, right? It's just, yeah. I don't mean just to minimize it because it's an incredibly difficult train to turn around. But it's not impossible to turn around. Yes. Yes, we can. I think of it as brainwashing. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been brainwashed, but we can throw ourselves in a hotel and lock the door until we come out. (laughs) And be not thinking that anymore because it's not true. Right. So if compassion is the foundation of all recovery, then the first step of recovery is to really find that compassionate peace. And not a lot of us have that. Right, right. So some of the tools to doing that is is to write your own story and to really go back and explore what it is that happened where you you needed to develop these behaviors to take care of yourself. And it's different right. for everyone. Right. For some, it's anxiety. For some, it was abuse of family. For some, it was alcoholism. For some, it was loss. For some, it was grief. You know, there's a Abandonment. Whole, Abandonment, PTSD, abuse, you know, there's a million different reasons just being sensitive in the world, Mm -hmm. you know, why people develop these behaviors to take care of themselves. So to really go back and look and understand what are the pieces that led to these behaviors. And then really from there, you get to start to understand the need underlying these behaviors. What are you really needing? Yes. And and having compassion for yourself for having these needs. Right. Because we have needs, even though we live in a culture <laughs> that says we should not have any right. needs. Don't right. be a needy person. Don't have any needs. Don't need help. Don't ask for help. Don't, you know, just be like a little uh, Western movie riding off to the sunset with you and your horse. And that's all. Right. That is not possible. Anymore. Right. And our our feelings come because our needs aren't being met. That's but right. But we're taught in this culture that we shouldn't be having feelings, right? So right. if you can't have feelings, then you can't figure out what your needs are, then you can't meet them. So you have to pick it up whatever you can to try to cope. Yeah. Yeah. Miller time. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> or fill in the blank. Or fill in the blank time. <laughs> right. So... One of the things that I wanted to bring into the conversation is our body love cards, uh, which we've taken uh, several parts of the recovery from an eating disorder and um, put them on cards. So there's a picture of a, a goddess with a deer on the front doing something. And then in the back is a description of that day's card and a little just for today, I will do this. There's 31 of them. You throw them in a bowl and pick one every day. So the one for compassion is very, um, it's very sweet. And I just want Carol to sort of talk about that compassion card. So the exercise for this compassion card is, um, today I will practice meeting each part of myself with compassion. When I feel critical of myself or others, I will consciously choose again to see the situation through the eyes of loving compassion. Yeah, so that's developing that non-judgmental observer. Right. So the non-judgmental observer is really important because that is the part of ourselves that allows us to be conscious of our behaviors and really watch and observe them so we can understand what we're needing. And 
usually we have developed a critical voice that when we do a behavior like we overeat or we undereat or we binge or we purge or we hate our bodies, we get mad at ourselves for doing that. So developing a non-judgmental observer means being a the part of ourselves that can observe it without judgment, with just acceptance, with that curiosity and inquiry, with mm -hmm. like the phrase, isn't this interesting? Isn't this interesting that right now I'm overeating after I hung up the phone with my doctor or whatever? Um, and it's, we talk about the scientist who mixed potion A with potion B and it blows up. And instead of saying, oh, you stupid chemical, why'd you blow up? What an idiot you are. You know, we say, well, isn't that interesting? What what made what chemical made A up. with chemical B blow up. Yeah, right. right. So it's just really creating that part of ourselves that can look at things as they are without judgment to deeply understand what's going on. That's right. And that's with anything, anything that we're sort of like, why do I do this? Why do I keep meeting the same guy over and over again? Or why do I keep having the same dead end jobs? Or why? Am I always struggling with money? We can do that with anything. Mm -hmm. Like develop that non-judgmental observer that goes, hmm, isn't that interesting? When you when this happens, this is what you do. What's that about for you? Right. 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 Well, Carol, it was a delight to have you here. I really appreciate you coming today and talking to us. And um, it's not about food. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed being here. Thank you. And we're going to, and don't forget, we have a teen book called Over It, which is a fantastic book. And anybody can read it, even if you're not a teenager, but you have an inner teenager that's pretty strong, which of course both Carol and I do. <laughs> so read it, read both of them. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And be sure and follow me on Patreon, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and it's not about food.com. Thanks.